This video is going to look at how to write accurate practical observations, where students go wrong in their language and what to look out for in exam questions about practical work. The first thing we need to think about is what can you actually observe or see with your own eyes if a question is asking you about an observation? Most of the common observations that we make in chemistry experiments are related to changes of state and changes of colour. So what can you actually see, which means that you can actually say that it's an observation in an exam question? Well, you can see a colour change. For example, if a solution turns blue from colourless, you can see precipitate. You may also describe this as turning cloudy, for example, lime water and carbon dioxide, but it is still a precipitate. It's a solid that is forming in a solution or in a liquid. You might see bubbles or fizzing. You can see solids disappearing. Now you may think that the word disappearing seems a little bit imprecise, but we'll explain why we use the word disappearing in a moment. You can also sometimes see movement. For example, group one metals will move across the surface of water, but that's not a particularly common one. So those are all perfectly good explanations of what you can see in a practical. What can you not see and therefore you shouldn't put if they're asking you for an observation? This is probably the number one one that students say, which is gas given off. Now I'm talking at the moment, but no one can see the gas coming out of my mouth. You can't see a gas unless it's coming off in a solution and is bubbling at the same time. You can also not see dissolving or reacting. So when I said we say we can say a solid disappears, that's my actual observation. We could also say that a piece of solid like a piece of magnesium gets smaller during a reaction and then disappears. But the thing is, Saying that it dissolves or saying that it reacts is an inference about why you see it disappear and it's not actually an observation that you can make. Heat and temperature change are also not things that you can actually see with your eyes. We will talk later on in this video about when we can talk about changes in temperature. pH change is also not something you can see without an indicator present and mass change isn't something that you can see with your own eyes. Sometimes we also need to make an observation when no reaction happens. So we sort of need to be clear occasionally that not everything in every question results in a reaction. But if we're asked for an observation, we shouldn't just say no reaction because again, you can't actually visibly see particles reacting with each other with your own eyes. Instead, you could say no visible change, no color change, whatever the question is asking about, you could say that that isn't changing or that it stays the same color. For example, when you add bromine to an alkane, it stays orange and it doesn't decolorize. Let's talk about colour changes now, because I think when we start chemistry, sometimes we think everything's coloured. It's all very exciting. And every picture that you look at just looks like hundreds of beakers of multicoloured substances. Actually, no, quite a lot of things are not coloured. So metals, we might need to talk about metals disappearing, appearing in a displacement reaction. Uh, don't call metals silver in their colour because, you know, that's an actual name for an element. Call them grey except copper, and again, don't call copper copper coloured, call it brown, red if you like, red brown. So compounds, transition metal compounds, we should know are coloured and black is a colour. Okay, so copper oxide, copper two oxide is black, for example. So those come into play when we look at metal displacement reactions, more common at GCSE, but they do come up at A-level. So for example, if I were to put a piece of magnesium in some copper sulfate, I can make a couple of observations. I can talk about the magnesium getting smaller. I could talk about the gray solid, which is magnesium, disappearing. I could talk about a brown solid, which is my copper, appearing. 
but I could also talk about the blue color of the copper sulfate uh, getting lighter and then becoming a colorless solution. And that's because magnesium is not a transition metal. So its solutions will be colorless when it replaces copper from a compound. Halogens, you need to know your colors. Chlorine is a green gas. Fluorine, not asked so much, but it's a sort of yellow gas. Bromine is an orange liquid and iodine is a gray solid. But we don't often use these halogens as pure halogens. We don't often have pure chlorine gas coming off in chemical reactions. Instead, we're going to be using them in solution. Chlorine is colorless in solution. You can't see that green color. And whereas bromine is kind of yellow orange and iodine is brown. So that is really common stuff that you need to know because of the displacement reactions and the redox reactions involving halogens at A level. You've also got indicators, acid base indicators, but also starch used as an indicator for iodine. And indicators are organic molecules, and there are some big complicated organic molecules that are coloured. So if you've done aldehydes and ketones, you'll have come across Brady's or 2,4-DMP, and you'll know that that gives you really bright yellow orange precipitates. However, this is uh, quite a niche area you wouldn't be expected to sort of look at an organic compound and know that it's coloured unless you're doing OCRB, in which case they do talk about that a little bit more. So that means that if you're just looking at a standard inorganic compound or a standard organic compound, you know, an aldehyde, a ketone, anything like that, they're going to be white solids if they're ionic, colourless solutions if we dissolve them, and that includes if they contain things like halogens, okay, so sodium bromide, is not coloured, uh, or they might be colourless liquids if they're organic, like ethanol or something like that. So pretty much everything else doesn't really give you a lot of obvious colour changes. So the question's really important. The context of the practical is important to what you write if you're talking about observations. So you need to look out in the question, does it mention a thermometer or a pH meter or an indicator or a gas syringe or does it mention testing for a gas or testing for some other chemical during the process of the experiment. So you have to look for these clues and remember that these clues might be part of a diagram. This one in the top left was a diagram that was used in an exam paper this year and at least 50% of students that I marked were missing the fact that it said universal indicator. And because they didn't talk about it in their observation, they missed one of the marks because it was a, a sort of compulsory mark. Even if they got two correct observations, they only got one mark if they didn't talk about the indicator. So you may get unfamiliar reactions that you don't know, either because you haven't learned them or because like uh, they're just not on your syllabus, in which case use things like the equation. Look for coloured substances that we just talked about and look for changes of state. So, for example, if you see a solid in the reactants and it's not in the products, then you can talk about that solid disappearing during the reaction. If you see a gas, you might want to immediately go for bubbles, but you need to be a little bit careful. So if we look at these two diagrams on the bottom, on the bottom right, we have clearly something that is producing bubbles and it is in solution. So I don't know what the picture is of, looks like magnesium and acid. So bubbles only happen if there is a liquid for the bubbles to form. So if it's the situation on this bottom left diagram where you're heating a carbonate, you do make carbon dioxide gas, but you won't see any bubbles in the test tube because that's a solid and you can't see bubbles through a solid. You may see movement in the solid because the gas is produced. Of course, in this one, we would definitely look at our observations going towards what happens in the lime water test tube, where we will see bubbles because the tube is going into the lime water and I'll see it go cloudy if it's carbon dioxide. So just be careful that you don't always assume bubbles. And also boiling is not bubbling, is not fizzing. Fizzing is creation of a new substance, a gas. Boiling is just a liquid turning into a gas. It's not a chemical reaction.
Some questions will ask you to make comparisons between two similar elements, for example, two different metals with water. Um, the obvious one is group one, but at A-level you also have to do group two. So say you had a question that asked you to talk about the difference between the reaction of strontium and the reaction of calcium. So what we don't want to say if this is an observation question is, for example, strontium is more reactive. It's true, but it's not an observation. You can't see the reactivity of a metal. You can only see what they do when you compare two reactions that they do. So you could say the reaction is more vigorous. That's a good way of sort of saying generally that it happens faster, gives off more heat, you know, it's just generally more visibly reacting. You can, of course, refer to the disappearing of the metal and say that it happens more quickly. And you can refer to the production of hydrogen gas and say that the bubbles are produced faster. Just note on these last two that we have a time element. It's about rate. It's like uh, disappearing more quickly, producing more faster gas. Don't just say more gas is produced. Uh, because more gas depends completely on how many moles of metal you put in and therefore how many moles of hydrogen you get. That is not related to reactivity or how fast it bubbles. OK, another one we can do quite often is an experiment when we need to know or explain how we can observe a reaction is finished or if a reactant has been used up. So there are lots of things, for example, where we mix reactants together and one of them is in excess. And you need to look out in the question for which substance is in excess. And you don't want to say things like, oh, add it until it's all reacted or keep going until the reaction stops, because that's not clear observations. Again, you can't see reactions happening. So it totally depends on the context of the practical, but here's some examples of quite common ones. So we could talk about it stopping fizzing. So, for example, I know that my um, acid will have been used up if I've got something that produces gas like hydrogen or carbon dioxide. Then I could say I know it's all gone when it stops fizzing. If we've got an excess of a solid, for example, we might be making a salt by an excess method, adding copper oxide to sulfuric acid, then we don't just say add it until it stops reacting. Because it's an insoluble solid, we will see solid left over at the bottom of the beaker. That's our observation to tell us that the acid has been used up and the solid is now in excess. If it was the other way around, so, for example, we might use a piece of magnesium. We would normally have our acid in excess so that we don't end up putting magnesium down the sink usually. And this time we would say all of the solid disappears. So I know that, you know, the magnesium has been used up because I can't see it anymore. What about if I have something where I'm measuring the temperature, like uh, particular titrations we might do this for, then we can say the temperature stops increasing. That's how I know when the reaction's finished. That happens a lot with energy change experiments. And the bottom right could be an experiment where we're trying to find the formula of a compound, maybe an oxide or a hydrated salt, and we're trying to find something like that. Anything where we are heating and then we're expecting the mass to change as we heat it. So either it goes up because it's reacting with something or it goes down because it's breaking down then we can say that we know that the reaction's finished because the mass stays the same even when we heat it. That's often referred to as heating to constant mass. Finally, we're just going to look at these three words because these are words where we also tend to lose a lot of marks in exam questions. Steam, smoke and fumes. Quite interchangeable words for most chemistry students but they're really, really not interchangeable at all. So smoke only refers to particles of soot which you get during combustion. In fact, you only get it really during incomplete combustion. So this is not normally something we actually talk about as a practical observation. There's only a couple of times I would say 
some exam boards expect you to know that alkenes or unsaturated hydrocarbons burn with a much smokier, sooty flame compared to saturated because uh, they've just got less hydrogen compared to carbon and so they're more likely to make carbon as soot. You could talk about soot appearing on the bottom of a can if you're doing a calorimetry experiment where you're measuring the enthalpy change for, of combustion. Uh, and that's a sort of observation that you might make related to it not you know, giving enough energy out. But it's not really something you can see while the experiment's happening. Fumes is a good word to use if you are giving off HCl gas or HBr gas. So not in solution. You should probably see in the equation that you will have gas as your state symbol or this happens in a lot of organic reactions particularly the reactions of benzene and things so hcl is given off there are also some reactions in some exam syllabuses of adding concentrated acid to solid uh, sodium or potassium halides like sodium chloride and then you get hcl given off so the fumes have various different ways of describing them. We can call them white fumes, misty fumes, confusingly, steamy fumes. Um, although actually, if you understand what you're seeing, it's not confusing at all. So we can't really see HCl. What we can see is it actually causes these little drops of condensation to form in the air. That's what we're actually observing. But any of those white fumes is nice and easy to remember. And that would happen for HCl or HBr or HI, of course. None of them are coloured because the compounds of halogens are not coloured. And steam is not really something you observe occasionally, maybe like a, a group one metal in water it gets particularly hot. It might boil a little bit of the water around it. But there are so many better observations you can make about that experiment that I wouldn't recommend using the word steam at all. And that's it.